Welcome everybody to today's webinar. My name is Anne LeBlanc and I'm part of the Mercer Workforce Solutions team and I'll be your host today. So I hope you enjoy today's session. So let's begin. Thanks Anne and it's great to be with all of you today and, and even more of a pleasure to have um, Robin and Andrew uh, join me on panel. Um, you know the topic today uh, is about skills um, and it couldn't come at a more important time uh, for us here in Australia uh, and New Zealand and in general uh, globally, but certainly in this part of the world. So I, I think that I speak for many of you today, um, if we take a look at the headline uh, at any point in time um, over these past uh, several months uh, in particular, what we know is that uh, the need to rethink work and to really consider different ways uh, to address the acute labor shortage crisis that we're facing into in Australia is, is not a nice to have, this is, this is a must have. And many of you, when we uh, talked to you and, and discussed in our Global Talent Trends study that we published earlier this year, it certainly indicated that you are feeling this pinch too. And, it, and, and this is happening right across all sectors at this point, you know, whether automotive, whether public sector, uh, tech sector, mining, uh, and so forth, um, it's, it's quite clear that at record unemployment lows uh, here in Australia, in particular, the skills shortage is a real challenge for all businesses today. But when we kind of boil this down um, and we look into uh, what this means for individuals and organizations today, you know, I'd like to talk us through a couple of key stats about what this means from a workforce challenges perspective on this next chart here. You know, um, as I mentioned earlier, you know, Mercer produces a study called the Global Talent Trends. This is the seventh year um, of that study. Um, you know, and what we found, you know, unsurprisingly, particularly in the Australian uh, respondents to this survey, where we had about 10,000 voices represented globally, the Australian component showed us something unsurprising, I'm sure to many of you. Um, we know that the majority of you are facing into a labor shortage crisis, as I just mentioned and showcased in the headlines. Um, we know that we're acutely worried about hiring and finding the right talent, and even more so at the right uh, price. Um, uh, you know, there's no surprise that in our inflationary environment at this point in time, coupled with uh, record low unemployment, that you know, the war for talent is hotter than ever. So certainly finding the talent and then getting that talent into the door and doing it at pace um, has become an increasingly challenging um, set of activities for us um, across all organizations. And then um, even more um, worrying for many of you, as you told us in the study, that 97% who responded to the question about plans to transform, whether that be digital transformation, business model transformation, culture transformation, workforce transformation, 97% of you are undergoing that transformation right now and are planning major transformation projects uh, this year and into the foreseeable um, one to two years. Um, many of us were thrust into that transformation, obviously as a result of pandemic. So those transformation initiatives have only just accelerated. And so while that's the case for many of you, 38% of you also stated that you're concerned about the lack of workforce capability and skills needed to drive that transformation. So I know I paint a, a slight picture of gloom and doom here. Um, I don't mean to do that at all. In fact, um, there's real uh, excitement. I think if you are um, like me and, and the members of this panel, fellow HR practitioners and, and thought leaders in this space and optimists at heart, there are some really important messages and really neat things that organizations are pursuing today, particularly around the rethinking of work and what that means and the opportunities it presents uh, to not just address the talent and skills uh, gap, but also what it means for workers globally, what it means for all of us globally uh, to be engaged uh, in the content of our work uh, to be constantly evolving and learning, um, and most importantly, to continue to be a thriving um, uh, workforce. 
Um, so I'm really excited um, that whilst we present many challenges to you uh, in this opening, that we dedicate the majority of our discussion today to the uh, recipe uh, that may in fact be one that could work for many of you as you think about transforming uh, your skills um, into a skills powered uh, set of talent practices and a way of thinking differently about that work. So before we get to that, I'd like to just uh, hear from many of you, and, and this is again um, kind of important um, it, to note that what you're seeing here in sort of this question about what are your plans to ensure you have a ready flow of skilled talent now and into the future, these five options aren't the only options clearly to address that question, but what we've done in this poll, and we would love you to select, this is multiple choice, you can select all or one or two, uh, whichever apply to you, but we'd love to hear from you. These are the top five uh, uh, answers that we received uh, in the Global Talent Trends study this year. Um, so we thought we would present these five um, to see what where you're at at this point in time, what your organization um, is pursuing. So it would be wonderful to, um, to have you uh, give us an indication, and then um, I'm also going to, uh, if I can, just flip us to the next slide and, and give you a sense of, of how others, uh, both in this market and globally, uh, responded to the same set of questions while you're answering yours. And, and we'll, of course, display the results of this poll um, once we've had uh, most of your, in your uh, input answered. So you can see that from a, a global and Australia perspective, we're, we're we're, we're thinking very similarly to our global counterparts, and there's no surprise there. You know, certainly ensuring our talent processes are, are specifically uh, geared towards recognizing the role of, of skills, particularly as we talk about how we pay for skills or rewarding the acquisition of new skills. And again, I don't want to steal uh, Robin's thunder, so I'm not going to go too far into that, but it's, it's really neat to see that Australia is right on to that, um, and that we can also see in the way that uh, we have been engaging with many of you over the past several months. Um, we know that in Australia, in fact, again, ahead of the curve here in terms of targeting reskilling and upskilling. Uh, and, you know, there's no surprise here, right? We um, are in, again, a very tight labor supply market here. And so many of you turning to reskilling and upskilling as an investment for now and into the future is no surprise to us as well. And again, ahead of the curve on hiring, promoting, um, and, and using those trends to help us continue to push the agenda on diversity, um, and equity and inclusion. So again, um, a neat uh, comparison there. And again, when I look at the poll results just now, we can see that we're actually not too far off. If anything, more, more than likely the passage of time has probably shown that ensuring talent processes are indeed attuned to skills um, against this poll that we've just taken with all of you here today would show that it's even increased right, over the time period from which we were collecting this data globally for the study um, over the last eight months. So really indicative, I think, Robin, isn't it, of just how quickly um, the conditions have changed. Um, and, and that's, again, not a secret to anyone that no one would have predicted uh, the current environment, geopolitical, economic, and so forth that we're in right now. So no surprise to me either that many more now are, are focused on ensuring these talent processes are aligned to skills. I could go on and on, Robin, I think, but I feel like I have built up a lot of suspense and excitement over the possibilities that you might present to us today um, and also share with us uh, how, it, how things are kind of shaping up globally, but certainly things that are we know that uh, we could uh, take back to organizations here in Australia and, um, and hopefully apply. So I, I might just hand over to Robin who can talk to us about what organizations, great ones are doing, particularly in the space of resetting uh, the work operating system. Great, thank you, Cynthia. It's such a pleasure to be here with you and Andrew and Anne, um, and, and obviously with all of our honored guests here. Um, so what I thought we might do over the next uh, few minutes or so is share a little bit of the, um, the, a little bit of the context for the uh, the book that my co-author John Boudreau and I just wrote, Work Without Jobs, um, why we wrote the book, um, the underpinnings of that operating system, and um, you know the data that Cynthia has just shared is, is such um, great sort of continued validation, if you will, for the timeliness of, of, of some of these ideas as we're seeing with, with companies around the world. 
and maybe sort of end up with a couple of case studies before I ha hand off to Andrew. So if we jump to the next slide, um, when, when John and I were sort of writing this book, and believe it or not, we actually started writing the book in March of 2020. Uh, could not have picked a better time uh, since neither of us was traveling, I suppose. Um, and we had lots of time on our hands. But as we were writing this book and watching, you know, the tremendous response from companies, many of them on the call today, many other organizations, the response to this pandemic, um, the, the ways in which they transformed, the way innovation really took hold, the way, you know, that human spirit really sort of adapted. It was absolutely fascinating. And it validated two things that were core principles that uh, were underpinned the reason we wrote the book, the reason that MIT asked us to write the book, which is as we look at this evolving world of work, um, there are the two most pivotal questions we see ourselves as business leaders and as HR leaders facing and dealing with for the foreseeable future. You know, the next 10, 20 years, uh, what you see on the slide. How are we going to redesign work to enable talent to flow to it as seamlessly as possible beyond the frictional cost of a job, which increasingly is proving to be one of the most fundamental uh, impediments to the transformation of many organizations. And at the same time, ensuring that we are sending the workforce, employees or otherwise, the right signals, assets and resources to enable their perpetual reinvention. And then secondly, Cynthia talked about the how important DEI is. And, and one of the things that we observed is when you go beyond the job, and you'll see this in one of the cases I'll share, that the opportunity for a much more inclusive work environment accelerate exponentially. But that second question, I think, is equally pivotal, which is how do we re-envision the talent experience so that we're meeting more and more talent increasingly on their terms? as opposed to forcing them to comply or fit a one size fits most model, which is what has often characterized the value propositions of organizations for, you know, for decades, you know, the better part of 150 years, um, because the fundamental building block was that notion of a job and, and that one-to-one -one relationship between a person and a position. So as we reflected on this, what we started to do as we were writing the book was sort of start to illustrate the art of the possible with some of those case studies and examples. If we go to the next slide, underpinning this response to these, these two pivotal questions is this shift um, from job to jobs to work. This pivot from that traditional one-to-one -one relationship between you know, a person and a position, and you could even extend that back to a degree uh, because the degree was that singular marker of capability, right? So that one-to-one -one relationship between a degree, a job, and a job holder to increasingly the possibilities of the many-to-many -many between skills and capability and work. And you can see that uh, pivot or that transition, if you will, from left to right, where on the left, when we think about development, as we've known for, for years, that, you know, the options are very limited um, because you are, you're either moving up or you're moving sideways. Um, and as you transition to, that, the, um, to an environment where you've got the many-to-many -many between the unique bundle of skills that is Cynthia versus Andrew, the many different ways in which they could contribute, be it in a job, in a, in, on a project, on an initiative, uh, an, an engagement, a team, et cetera, um, and the many different ways in which they could grow and develop um, and what you start to see is, and this is where the power of AI becomes, you know, really comes to the fore, um, is where AI becomes that uniquely powerful tool that acts as a, a mechanism for helping to guide the individual's growth and development across not just that binary choice of a vertical or a horizontal change, but potentially dozens and dozens of uniquely bespoke um, reskilling and upskilling and development pathways that are unique to each of us. We also start to see as, that tradition, as the traditional markers of capability, i.e. degrees and, and, and limited experiences start to give way to you know, seeing the whole person. We start to see how AI can actually help us transcend many of the traditional markers of bias. And I'll talk about this when we talk about 
um, one of the examples and case studies in the book, Unilever, and what they've done to create a much more inclusive organization. Um, so it really, this, this pivot from left to right is at the heart of what is going to be a fundamental retooling of work and organizations as we see it. Um, if we jump to the next slide, I want to just spend a few minutes talking about um, the four principles that underpin work without jobs and the new work operating system that, that John and I described. One that is underpinned by ta the fundamental tasks and activities of the organization and the skills and capabilities of the workforce, as opposed to one that is underpinned by jobs. And if you think of the way our organizations operate today, right? Everything about what HR does, everything about what finance does, and everything about what IT does, if you step back and think about it, is based on that basic building block of that one-to-one -one relationship between a person and a position. All of the elements of our talent life cycle based on that notion of a job. Everything that we know about how businesses account for success financially is based on that basic building block of a job aggregated into job families, into functions, into divisions, into organizations. Everything about the technology infrastructure, again, based on that notion of a person in a position, if you think about ERP systems. And what John and I laid out were all of the impediments um, that come in the way when you have that basic currency um, and the opportunities for driving an ever more agile organization by transcending the job and having those basic building blocks of tasks and skills as the currency. And as we were writing the book, there were four principles that kind of um, sort of emerged to us as we were doing that work. The first was, as we looked at the organizations who were really successful um, in, in sort of being future-proofed, if you will, um, that they started with the work, not the way the work was organized. What are the elemental tasks and activities, both the ones that exist today and the ones to come, as opposed to how those tasks and activities are organized? Secondly, by starting with the work, they achieved a much more optimal combination of humans and automation. Uh, some of you may have read my, my third book, Reinventing Jobs, that John and I wrote that was published by the Harvard Business Review. Um, and in that book, with about 130 case studies, we illustrated how companies that led with the work, as opposed to led with the technology, achieved exponentially greater outcomes. They saw where human endeavor could be substituted, highly repetitive rules-based work, where critical thinking, empathy, care and concern, innovation could be augmented, and that individual almost uh, made superhuman in their productivity uh, by using technology to augment that, um, those skills. And then where the presence of automation actually created the demand for new skills and the space for new human work. So a much more optimal set of outcomes. And then thirdly, once you've considered that the optimal combination of talent and technology, what's the best way to connect talent to work? As you'll see in a second, um, you know, the job is still relevant despite the title of the book, uh, uh, albeit, you know, the percentage of work, as we see, being done in full-time jobs is shrinking dramatically and exponentially. But what are all the other ways in which talent could connect to work? Should it be a gig worker? Should it be an employee, but one who connects to work through an agile talent pool? You know, should it be the employee of an outsourcer, an alliance partner, or some other demand some other part of a broader ecosystem for work options. And then the fourth principle being, how do we consistently reduce the frictional cost of work? How do we allow talent to flow to work um, and creating a mindset and a capacity to keep perpetually reinventing work? I often say to my clients, you know, in the good old days, we could do a transformation once every seven years and reset our business models. I don't think we have that luxury anymore. And the, the organizations that really are thriving are the ones that have that mindset of perpetual reinvention, where they don't separate run the business from transform the business. It is one holistic cycle. And against that, we laid out um, three ways in which we're seeing companies connect talent to work. Um, on the left is kind of where we've been for 130 years of the world of work, um, where where employees are in fixed roles. And, and think of these three models 
as, and not to be too cute about it, but fixed flex and flow. Um, so fix is again, where we've been for, uh, for forever, but there are many good reasons why a job will still be with us. You know, there's just a convenient volume of work that justifies that being bundled into a job. Um, in, for many of you, there are compliance and control reasons um, because of the regulatory nature, uh, the, because your businesses might be regulated. You might have oversight from different third parties, et cetera, and the job is that mechanism for oversight. Now, the infrastructure that enables that are the things that we are all intimately familiar with, our job architectures. Um, again, with the job as the currency of work, that is the fundamental means through which work is organized. Workforce planning tends to look more like position-based planning as we look at the flow of talent from, from one job to another to ultimately leaving the organization. And our systems, you know, this, this, these, this is where the ERP systems, uh, your work days and your success factors are the basis for enabling that job um, as the currency of work. What we're seeing more organizations do though, is if you go one click to the right, is where talent might still be, um, sorry, we could actually go back a, pre, uh, a slide, sorry, I, I shouldn't have said one click to the right there. Um, but in, in, the, in the middle of that, in, with the flexible model, work might still be organized in jobs, but the talent has the flexibility to express their skills in other domains or to go acquire new skills in different domains. Um, and this is where we're in this interesting hybrid position because you've got the combination of the job and skills becoming the currency of work. And it's where we see companies augmenting their ERP systems with internal talent marketplaces like Gloat, Eightfold, Fuel50, Hitch, just to name a few of those marketplaces, um, uh, Rejig, um, just to name a few, a few of them that because the organizations are starting to see that these marketplaces are essential for connecting the skills of the workforce to the work while sending the, the workforce the signals as to where what skills are being demanded and how they can close their skill gaps. And workforce planning, to the question that Cynthia asked um, in the poll, which I was quite intrigued to see that there was a rather small percentage of you that was planning uh, that were planning to have skills based workforce planning but we are seeing that start to come to the fore in many organizations around the world and i'll illustrate this example in in, in, a, in a few in a few minutes um, and then on the far right this is what i think of as being agile on steroids um, we know many organizations have gone down the agile pathway um, but one of the things that has often stymied their progress is this notion of work being bound up in jobs. Even as they move to squads and tribes, the job is still the currency of work. And you'll see shortly an example of an organization that moved to a completely skills-based system. Um, all the work was still being done by employees, but they were being connected to work through the marketplace. So the marketplace really does become kind of that central orchestrator, if you will, for connecting people to work. So three models um, that we're seeing many organizations embrace. And if I think of the distribution of work increasingly with some of the most progressive uh, companies that I've had the chance to sort of look at, um, if at the beginning 100% of work was done on the far left, we're seeing organizations where potentially 30% of work may be on the left, you know, 50 to 60% might be in the middle and potentially between five to 15 or 20% might be on the far right um, where you've got these completely agile pools uh, that are connecting to work through um, skills architectures. And if we go to the next slide, the, the thing that is compelling many organizations to act and to move to the right, are frankly, the exponential gains they've seen along the lines of the metrics that you see on the bottom of the slide. So whether it's reduced time to fill, you know, one of the initial starting points for many organizations who use these marketplaces is, you know, boy, this is a way to supercharge our job boards um, and make emerging positions more visible to the talent we have today and match them up. So it's a, a way to fill jobs. But as they move towards more agile ways of working, as they move towards skill-based architectures, we're seeing exponential gains in productivity and speed and agility. And I'll share in a second an example with you of one organization that saw a 600% gain in productivity of their digital talent. 
So I'm hoping these three models make some sense. What I'd like to do now is maybe jump into two examples before I hand off to Andrew, um, who's gonna take us deeper into the marketplace. So I talked about the, the flexible model and the, the, the story I love to share about this is Unilever. I've had the privilege of working with then CHRO Lena Nair and the great HR team at Unilever since 2017. Um, and was asked originally to help the organization develop their, their framework for the future of work. And the reason that we, I was asked to help work with them on that was Alan Job, the CEO, and Lena Naya um, had this narrative that every day our business model is changing. We've got new competitors, we've got startups, we're making decisions about our portfolio, we're making technology decisions. So our business models are perpetually reinventing yet somehow those signals don't get down to all of our talent. How do we ensure that our talent understands and has that mindset of perpetual reinvention while ensuring that they can meet the needs of themselves and their families? And so they started with reinventing and rethinking performance management. I haven't met a CHRO yet who, who, who isn't dissatisfied with his or her performance management process. And what Unilever did was to say, we're gonna have these four questions, um, which are going to be raised with our talent every year. And these four questions are about indexing to our purpose. And some of you may know Unilever is, is an organization that is quite steeped in purpose, whether it's their brand or their company or their talent. And these four questions lead to a future fit plan that's made up of essentially two parts how you'll ensure the continued well-being of yourself and your family. And then secondly, how you'll ensure your continued professional relevance. Um, will you be upskilled for the job that you're in today? Um, because that job is gonna change. It's never gonna be static. Um, or could you be reskilled for an alternative job within the organization? Um, and what are the skill gaps that, that you have? And what are the learning resources you need to close those skill gaps? Or alternatively, if you decide to move um, elsewhere, how do we ensure that you are equipped to move um, to a position where you can successfully contribute? So instead of traditional outplacement, how do we give you a stipend and how do we um, ensure your continued relevance by upskilling or outskilling you? That then led to the introduction of their internal marketplace. And as some of you may have seen in um, Alan Job's letters, letter to his shareholders last year, 40,000 people at Unilever in 2020 actually took on projects, assignments, and gigs um, at the height of the pandemic. And it allowed the organization to respond to the pandemic in a fundamentally different way. Now, all of these, most of this talent are in full-time jobs, but they have the space and the time and the capacity to express their skills in different projects, assignments that were mission critical for the organization, or to go acquire new skills and experiment and learn new things and understand you know, where their passions might take them within the Unilever construct. And the last thing that I'll share about Unilever is um, this journey of moving, of perpetual reinvention and moving to greater flexibility has now led to their Uflex program. And Uflex is a program to go back to where I started of basically trying to get meet as many people as possible on their individual terms, with flexibility really being at the heart of the model. So if you're a retiree who's choosing to sort of transition out, can we give you a stipend to stay as a part of our community and pro provide you with project-based incentives as you contribute, as you mentor the next generation, et cetera. Um, so this journey towards flexibility, all based on the notion of giving people access to opportunities to express their skills and acquire new skills elsewhere. Um, so that's that middle column of flexibility. If we go to the, the next slide, I'd like to then share, and we can probably go one click forward, I think. Thank you. Um, an example of that far right model, what I called, uh, what was the flow model, what I called agile on steroids. And this is a story that I was really, really privileged um, to be able for, for John and I to be able to tell in the book. So this organization is one of the largest insurance companies in the world. And they were increasingly being stymied by how little leverage they were getting from their data scientists. So 
their customer analytics function, which did really cool and sexy work, was able to get the talent. They could pay the market premiums, but HR couldn't get any data scientists. Claims and underwriting couldn't get any data scientists. And so what they saw were these pockets of great immense wealth and pockets of poverty in the organization. And, and the recognition that data science was gonna be foundational to everything they as a company did. And so the leadership team made the decision to kind of blow up this job family. They pulled them out of the geographies and the functions, and they created this virtual cloud-based organization. Um, and in their desire to move towards a skills-based structure, did not replicate or recreate this job family in another in, in this cloud-based structure. Instead, they put all of the all of the talent into one job code and workday. But the idea being that that job code would establish a baseline for compensation against which um, they would flex um, actual pay based on skill-based premiums. And now the talent would connect to work um, through projects and assignments. They were all employees. They just weren't going to connect to work through jobs. They were going to connect to work through projects and assignments. So let me give you an example. So let's say I'm the person who runs Australia. And I'm, um, I, I need to set up a new direct-to-consumer channel. So in the good old days, I would have gone and opened a rec for a UI UX designer and perhaps a data scientist. Well, today I sit down with the head of my, the new HR center of expertise that is responsible for teaching managers and working with managers to design projects because managers don't generally have the capability to design projects because most of the work is being done in jobs. So, so now I sit down with Cynthia, who's my, my, my COE lead, and we spec out this direct-to-consumer channel. Well, we need a customer interface. That's gonna require a, um, a mobile website. That's gonna require UI and UX design skills. And it's gonna take this long to get that done. I need a recommendation engine that's gonna recommend products to existing customers. Well, that's gonna require some analytics and it's gonna require Python skills to program those analytics. You kind of get the picture. So we spec out this project and then the project is dropped into the marketplace. Um, the marketplace then is looking at this pool of talent. They started off originally with all their data scientists, but this was so wildly successful, they expanded it to all their digital talent after 18 months. Um, so we dropped the project into the marketplace and the marketplace is looking at four things. It's looking at who's got the skills to do the work. It's looking at who's got the interest or who's gonna benefit developmentally from doing the work. So if, if I'm that five-star Python developer, um, you know, I might score high on interest, but if I've done five direct-to-consumer channels, I'm gonna score really low on that interest um, quotient because I'm not gonna benefit from doing another direct-to-consumer channel. Someone else would. Um, the third variable is who has the capacity to do the work, um, you know, that do I have six months at 50% time to do the work? And the fourth screen, probably the most important one, is that diversity, equity, and inclusion screen. In most organizations, if you think of work being done in jobs, our ability to address DEI is incredibly episodic. We do it when we hire someone, we do it when they when we make a pay decision, we do it when if someone's position changes. In a pure project-based environment, you've literally got hundreds, if not thousands of opportunities to address de and &I. And so what the algorithm does is that it looks at the diversity of different talent pools. So let's say my pool of five-star Python developers is all hypothetically Asian men. And by giving me that project, you know, the diversity of the pool is, is, is not at all increased. Uh, in fact, it's going to remain what it is. Um, however, we have a four-star Python developer who has the skills to do the work, but has never done a direct-to-consumer channel before, um, and that might be an African-American female. And by giving her access to this work, she gets elevated into that five-star pool because doing a direct-to-consumer channel was a condition of entry into that five-star pool, to, uh, and, that, and that in turn drives the wage premium. And so if you think about it, all of these projects give you an opportunity to assess diversity, equity, and inclusion literally hundreds and hundreds of times over the course of a year. I wanna just end the story with three really interesting findings that they did not anticipate. The first was, and Cynthia alluded to this at the beginning, um, 
As work changes, the signals we send to our talent so they can reskill, you know, are incredibly opaque if visible at all. And what you have with a marketplace is because you've got the volume and velocity and variability of work going through the marketplace. Now the algorithm is able to infer and send signals. So because with all the work being done in the marketplace, you have a clear sense of demand. The algorithm knows the supply of skills and it's able to assess where the skill gaps are. So I, again, as that five-star Python developer, get an email from the algorithm that says, hey, Robin, you know, demand for Python on our marketplace is trending down because, and, and instead we're seeing demand for Julia trend upwards. Here's access to two learning resources that will get you upskilled in Julia um, over the, and you can complete these courses over the next three months. So now you've got that direct signal from demand to supply to the skill gaps and interventions to close those skill gaps. And this was happening literally dozens of times a day with all the projects that were being done. The second key finding, I mentioned that they had a skills-based pay structure. So base pay was a function of the skills you had and everyone had an incentive, which was tied to the success of every project that you were on. But for those of you who've done this a while as I have, you may remember back in the 90s, we had something quite similar and it was called competency-based pay. Um, and competency-based pay in the 90s died a quick death because I and many of my colleagues received these nice emails from company CEOs that said, uh, well done, you've put this new competency-based pay architecture in. Thank you for single-handedly elevating our weight structure without a commensurate improvement in profitability or productivity. And so this organization's answer to that problem was, we're gonna get this great Mercer skills pricer data for data scientists, but the actual change in pay, the actual skill premium is a function of our ability to commercialize those skills, not just what the market is saying, but what we can actually do with those skills. And because the marketplace knows how quickly or how inefficiently we commercialize skills, the marketplace is the best indicator of what that premium should be. And the last learning from a leadership development perspective was as more and more work was being done in the marketplace, more of the supervision and coordination was being taken on by the market and it left the managers, quote unquote, free to focus on the things that we, we asked them to do all the time, coach, develop, mentor, that team that they have within their stewardship for the nine months that that project is running, not focus their time on the nuts and bolts of supervision and coordination. So I'm hoping that case studies is a good example of the power of that more agile way of you know, having a pure skills-based ecosystem versus one that's tied to jobs. I'm gonna hand it to Andrew now to take us to the next phase. Thanks, Robin. There was some really tremendous um, insights around those case studies um, that I'm sure everybody found really valuable. Um, we'll just jump to the next slide, Anne. I mean, what I wanted to do is just over the next 10 minutes or so is really just talk about, I suppose, the role of technology and really what's happening and what we're seeing in the market at the moment. I'll have to disclose that I am a little bit of a HR technology tragic. Um, I, I you know, find it terribly interesting. I also find it terribly frustrating that you know, unfortunately, HR just hasn't really leveraged the technology um, that is available over the years. And, and we've been much, much better. Um, but I think one of the things that excites me most about this place is because while the HRIS platforms really, you know, looked at automating the, the key HR verticals, um, the talent marketplace is really around um, allowing HR to be a lot more strategic and impacting, you know, the business outcomes more significantly than we ever have. So for me, it's a pretty exciting piece um, in terms of where we're at. Just on the talent marketplace, just even that name, I think one of the things we need to call that first is, is that is being used interchangeably by, um, you know, a lot of the different vendors at the moment. And, and broadly, the vendors have, you know, similar um, platforms with, you know, various different modules. But in essence, we are talking about two key different things. So we're talking about what's referred to as workforce intelligence um, in the system. Um, and the other component is really around um, 
the talent marketplace that Ravan spoke about. So let me just talk a little bit about the workforce intelligence piece first, because I think that that's, and there was a question that I just read on the Q&A and I might answer, uh, try to answer some of that in, a, in this session. Um, in terms of the workforce intelligence, that's really all about um, the AI and that's really about getting the employees. So looking at your HR systems, your core HR, getting your employees into the platform um, and then the AI in, in a couple of different ways, um, having a look and creating that skills framework or that, that skills ontology within your organization. So how does it do it? It, it looks at basically, um, you know, it'll scrape the, the data that's out there um, that, you know, whether it be LinkedIn or other data, um, but it also has its own AI where it's saying, you know, for these roles that you've put into the system, these are the skills that we've got. There was a question around, um, you know, how do you validate the skills? And that is something that this is emerging with the technology platforms, because there are certain skills that, you know, through either assessments or, or other forms, organizations are going to want to have validated. So the, the third part of that is really getting then employees. So the technology platforms will say that they can create that skills framework for you without employees going in. But that only probably gives you somewhere around 50 to 60 percent of a total view of your skills within your organization. The, the Nirvana is obviously having everyone in your organization go in, fill in um, their view of their skills. And then, as I said, that secondary question of which are the skills you want to try to validate um, within your organization that are critical to really having that validation process in there. Um, that then gives you, as I said, what's referred to as that workforce intelligent piece. And, and, and how do you use that? So, you know, there's various ways. Um, one of the most obvious ways is it can start to inform your job architecture and also your skills framework. Now, one of the questions we get is, does this replace the job architecture? Now, I think when you think about Ravan's um, model around the, the fixed flow and flexible, what we're really saying there is that, you know, the interrelatedness between your traditional job architecture and your skills framework is something that organizations are gonna to need to work through and understand uh, in terms of how do they think about skills in an organization. So certainly that workforce um, intelligence piece can help you think about your traditional job architecture model, but equally important start to put you down that journey of understanding that skills framework um, as well within the organization. Um, probably most importantly, one of the things that will be able to do is with um, strategic workforce planning. You know, that's always been an area, I think, for most organisations that's been, um, you know, the holy grail. Um, how, how do we get to the next three to five years, um, you know, and align our business strategy to our overall skills and where we are today? So, you know, the, the workforce intelligent component of a talent marketplace gives you that you know really robust understanding of the skills that you have today if you've done the work around well what's our business strategy and the skills that we need in the next five years and we're doing and talking with many organizations who are in that position now because their organizations are changing um, you know the skills that they need to drive their organization where they want to be you know sometimes are 40 50 60 percent different to the skills they have today so what is that delta between those two and then you can start to really work through what are the strategies that you're going to get there. So, you know, the traditional buying and build and everything else that goes with that. But what does that roadmap look like around getting to that end point around that strategic workforce plan that organisations need? So, um, you know, there's a lot that can be done in the, the SWP space. Robin mentioned the DEI, um, you know, clearly that workforce intelligent component of a talent marketplace can great, provide some great insight um, into the DEI of an organisation and, and where are we paying for skills and where are we not and, and how does that actually look like from an um, equity pers um, perspective. The other big component about the talent marketplace is what's now referred to as the talent marketplace and, and some of the areas that really um, impacts is things like your talent acquisition. So, you know, traditionally we're still hiring for jobs and, you know, looking at um, in a very linear way, what are the types of jobs people have done previously? And then, you know, are they able then to do this job in, term, you know, in terms of our organisation? The talent marketplace then can start to say, well, actually, can we think about those jobs in terms of roles? And then so then can we actually hire, you know, for transferable skills and hire laterally um, and people who may not have actually done a job that is actually has that similar job title 
but has been able to demonstrate all of those skills that we need. I mean, that then significantly opens up that external marketing or that external market in terms of available resources to fill those jobs. So, you know, being able to do that from a talent acquisition from an external, but then obviously there's a lot of discussion and Robin gave that um, ex uh, both those examples and those case studies around the internal piece and how the projects and the gig work can really be leveraged through a, a talent marketplace once you have an understanding of the skills within your organisation. Um, similar around, similarly around the succession, you know, again, traditionally and for most organisations, succession is based on the roles that you have done. Um, and again, if you think about all the talent pools internally that you might be missing around the roles, because there's all these transferable skills that people have got, um, but they're not on your succession plans because they haven't done the roles that you've identified as being needed to be done. So it really does open up again, a significant talent pool, impacts DEI, whole bunch of benefits around them, you know, how do you move your organization forward from a succession piece. Um, one of the other areas is around careers. Um, and I think I'll, I'll put careers and learning together in this from a talent marketplace. So you know, people can start to genuinely think about what are the skills that I want to develop um, but not necessarily in the context of the roles that I want to go to, but more in the context of what are the skills that the organisation are actually saying we need moving forward. Um, and then if we're starting to advertise for work to be done internally based on skills as opposed to roles, people are potentially more willing to think through different career paths and, and again, opening up that, you know, that talent pool. So, you know, the, the one thing I'll say is that... Um, the, the talent marketplace technology is not about the technology, you know, in itself. It, it really is so much broader that organisations need to think about. There's so many different areas that the technology is going to allow organisations to leverage right across the HR verticals. Um, and, and, you know, there's a lot of talk about that very small bit around the talent marketplace, and that's a great place to start for organisations in terms of internal um, mobility and moving people around based on their skills. But as you can just see from this one, you know, I won't call it a simple slide, but oh, it's a very busy slide. There are many different things that need to be thought through. So I'll just go to the next slide and, and close on this slide because that is the other question we get asked a lot. And, and you know, how are we helping organisations get started? So. You know, whether it's something as simple as a visioning workshop around, you know, we are here today, where do we want to get to in the next three to five years? Um, some organisations are looking at doing a value creation study to see or a more comprehensive business case to see, you know, where and how do we get this off the ground and how do we make sure that the whole organisation is bought into this? Um, other organisations are starting by understanding their job architecture and then understanding what their skills framework would look like um, if they move to, you know, that fixed flow um, and, um, and flexible model. What does that look like for the roles? So there are a lot of different entry points for this, um, you know, and there's not necessarily a single entry point that is right. It really does depend on, you know, the maturity of your organisation, some of the work that you might have done previously um, to get you to a point that you can start to think about the implementation of the technology to support it. Um, some organisations have started with the technology and, you know, gone back and thought about, well, okay, how do we actually think about a skills framework now? So it, for me, it really is thinking about, well, where do you want to get to? What's the end point? What's the next sort of three to five years, years look like? And then go from there. So um, I'll throw back to Cynthia, I think it is, or Anne. Um, yeah, throw back to me. <laughs> All right. Um, so I'm going to just rest on this slide for one moment. Um, and we have a few questions coming through um, the Q&A, which is fantastic to see. So we'll see if we can get to as many of them as possible. Um, so just a shout out that um, if you've got a great question that you a question, um, if you'd love to ask um, any one of the panelists, then please um, pop it in the Q and A uh, now, and we'll, and we'll get through through them. If we don't happen to get through them all today, we will definitely be um, sending you 
um, the pack and the recording and we'll also aim to answer all those questions as well. So I might just open up the Q&A box and see what first question we have. Um, so I might actually throw this um, to you, Ravan, um, and bring you in on this. So Kate asks, what AI systems are organisations using to do that automation part of identifying skills and demand? So, so this would be um, uh, basically machine learning that would be doing that. And machine learning is the underpinning of all of the platforms that I mentioned a little while ago, those talent marketplaces. Um, and one of the beauties of this, and this touches on one of the other questions that was raised um, about assessing skills and validating them is, um, and we did this experiment with the World Economic Forum with one of these platforms and the across the consumer products industry group um, of companies, the average employee when asked to identify the skills he or she had, had a list that was about seven long. When the algorithm went through and looked at all of that person's previous work, their previous projects, their education, et cetera, basically all of the stuff that um, we, have, we, we might have on a LinkedIn profile, the average starting point was 24. So it put the organization in a much, much better place to understand the complete makeup of skills and then to go through the process of validating which skills were real versus not versus spending the time on discovery. So it's the short answer um, to Kate's question is it's, it's machine learning and it's at the heart of all of these marketplaces. And that certainly opens up a whole other view of the organization if you move from seven to 24, that's, in, that's an incredible um, uptick in um, identifying those skills. Uh, another question um, I might ask is around, is there a critical, and Ravan, this might be to you in terms of, because you've worked with so many different companies, um, is there a critical number or minimum threshold in terms of the number of employees or org size um, for the approach to be really effective? Yeah, you know, I actually think, um, certainly we've seen lots, you know, many large companies, we talked about Unilever, there are many examples out there of, you know, Standard Chartered is another great example of an organization that has in a very effective marketplace has done really well in implementing it. Um, so many large organizations um, are using these marketplaces to get greater visibility into their talent, as Andrew was describing it. But I actually think smaller organizations have a massive leg up on, on these uh, larger companies because by definition, the insight into the talent is, is, is already there in smaller companies. And I think in smaller companies, um, you know, under a thousand, um, under 500, there are naturally much less boundaries to movement to be able to express your skills. So I think the mindset that underpins work without jobs can certainly be realized by any organization. But I think the smaller you are, the more you have the that natural agility kind of baked into your DNA anyway. And, and Ravan, I just might add to that. I think, um, you know, like many of the new vendors and, look, you know, this space is relatively new. You know, most of the talent marketplaces have only been around sort of six, seven, eight years. But because they are all and all did start as, as cloud businesses, Many of them are pushing down into the, the small business SME market because their cost model allows them to do it because it is subscription based. So the barriers to entry for smaller organizations in the space um, aren't as significant as they used to be uh, in terms of the old on premise solutions where you know, they were in the millions of dollars, even regardless of what size of your organization. So now you just literally pay, you know, the subscription model, um, you know, for the amount of employees in your organization. So it really is an opportunity for all levels of organization um, to be able to leverage. Great. We've got, we've got a few minutes left. So I might just ask this question and it's a big question. So maybe we might keep it tight and then we'll put more detail um, as we respond. But Anoop asks, um, how do large complex global organizations go about unwiring their complete system process structures to start doing this? Um, and because this is a seismic shift of, of thinking. So I might start with you, Andrew, and just get a couple of words from you on this question. Yeah, thanks. And look, I think it goes back to, um, as I said, what's the entry point for you as an organisation and really understanding what level of maturity that you have um, and also understanding and approaching it in a way that thinks about the different parts of your business and where this lends to. I think the uh, 
Ravan's example around the global insurer where, um, you know, those types of roles, um, you know, technology resources tend to be happy to move. They don't think about uh, work in the traditional way that we've worked in, um, you know, in kind of 30 years, plus the type of work lends it to, lends it to moving around. Um, you know, so it's about thinking about where can we start this within our organisation um, and then how do we potentially roll that out more broadly? I think keeping in mind that model of, you know, fixed, um, flexible and flow is critically important because it's not going to be for every part of the organization um, but how do we actually get the benefits of it in the parts that really um, are open to it and, and can leverage it so Robin yeah um, you know I, I, Andrew I think you, you've captured it well I, I think where we're seeing more and more organizations go is by doing a couple of things one is just with their overall sort of talent or HR architecture, you know, their compensation structure, their benefits, et cetera, enabling much more flexibility in choice, which I know is something we've talked about for, for many, many years. Um, but we're really starting to see that come, come to the fore, um, particularly with some of the advances in, in technology that enable people to make trade-offs and, and, and make informed choices of trading off, for example, you know, base pay for maybe more vacation days. Um, we, we actually had one organization we worked with where people were trading off, um, you know, were willing in the in their conjoint service to trade off some base pay for a better manager. Um, now that would be a neat trick, I suppose, but, um, but we are seeing not just more insight into those, um, those trade offs, but more flexibility in terms of the choices that people are making. So that way you're able to sort of meet again, more people on their terms versus trying to fit, you know, trying to make a single model fit, you know, a, a very diverse workforce. Great. Thanks, Robin. Thanks, Andrew, for answering um, those questions. We actually had um, quite a few other questions, so we will definitely respond to these um, in the post webinar materials. Um, we're going to run a quick poll now, so we'd really love to get your thoughts on the quick poll. And whilst that happens, I'll just do a quick wrap up. Um, and so thank you for attending today and giving us your time. We know that's really valuable. Um, I definitely want to thank and shout out to Ravan for joining us um, and providing his insights and highly recommend um, Work Without Jobs. You can get a free um, book excerpt there, but um, definitely, uh, definitely jump in and grab the book. Um, thanks to Andrew and Cynthia for joining us today. Uh, we also have some other research material that you might find um, really relevant and topical um, to, to this, this connected world. Um, and of course, if you want to get in touch with us, then click, click the QR code and we'll you know, reach out to you um, uh, shortly. But thanks again, and we really hope that you uh, enjoy the rest of your day.